Uh, next up is Gary Riger of Brooklyn Software. And, you know, we're now kind of scaling the mountain of complexity. Um, we went from these kind of low resolution, simple apps that are based around business challenges uh, to a more sophisticated use uh, of that middle ground of AI enhanced automation, but leveraging tools and tool kits uh, that are off the shelf. And, um, you know, we've been talking about this, like, how do you know which AI tools to use? I feel overwhelmed. Like, we're at the, the very beginning uh, of the nightmare that is, uh, you know, AI tools. Um, like, this is going to be a very crowded marketplace uh, for the foreseeable future. And part of it is because it's relatively easy to build a tool, as you're about to learn from Gary. But, uh, you know, Sequoia Capital Venture Investors, uh, you know, shared uh, this list. Uh, of the generative AI landscape, um, and it just keeps growing. One of the people who's guilty uh, of, of getting this landscape uh, even more filled is, is Gary Riger of Brooklyn Software. Um, he's the co-founder and head of product. And uh, basically, uh, he's uh, you know an entrepreneur at heart, but he is finding use cases and then building software to, to solve for them. And um, one of the things that he's done is to make his life easier uh, by developing an app that he calls brooklynai.co. And so over to you, Gary, to share a little bit uh, about brooklynai.co, uh, share with people how they can use it and talk to them uh, about the process of building it. Sure, hi everybody. So, um, you know, I think we'll have some interesting slides that kind of go through the, the mental framework. Uh, but I'll give you a, a high level. You know, I'm generally an innovator. Um, I get into things very early. Um, I got into blockchain. I got some grants there uh, to build some some blockchain technology that was, you know, ahead of its time in, in about 20, started in 2017, built, built in 2019. And so, you know, I came into AI with the same framework as like, okay, well, I'm going to swim in this giant pool of like, apps and products and networks and developers, you know, where do I start? And I think, um, and what's my angle and what's my spin and how am I going to sort of contribute? And that's really what this is kind of about is sort of my process of, of thinking through what to build and how to build it. Um, and I guess we can go to the next slide. So this is an overview of the app. Um, essentially, you're going to see just a quick demo of how it works. So my my main uh, perspective on AI and ChatGPT actually came from my wife um, because for me, I was just amazed at all the things that it can do. And my, when I asked my wife to go on and try it out, she actually said, well, I find it way overwhelming. And that kind of struck me as interesting. Um, we talked a lot about prompts here. And so my solution was, well, what if we can extract away all of that complexity and make it as easy as possible to the everyday business owner, right? And I think what Dan had mentioned is a lot of you here are really early, which also probably means that you may be a bit more te tech savvy, um, but a lot of business owners, and maybe it, it, it is you, maybe it's it's the people you work with, maybe it's, uh, it, it's your friends, family, employees, et cetera, they may not want to understand the dynamics of prompting the dynamic and so what i try to do is build an app that looks good on mobile it looks good on web that really just solves basic business problems um and i guess we can move on uh, to the next slide so this is was a kind of an example but let's just kind of go through this so um the biggest one of the questions you sort of have to ask as an engineer of these types of applications it's sort of like well do i choose something that is gonna be custom or do I develop something that is no code, which is extremely popular. Um, and I've done both in my life. I've led a team of engineers, QA designers, project managers, you know, all of these types of folks. Uh, and I've built some, some pretty amazing, you know, high stakes products, you know, products that are high infrastructure. Uh, one of the apps we actually built is for the Milan, so the official Milan soccer team in, in um, uh, in, in Europe. So we need quick data. We need, you know, uh, millions of users, people, when, especially when the game is live, you have a lot of people checking live scores. And so for every, uh, for every end, there's sort of a, a means, you know, ways to get there. And, 
And so for me, you know, as somebody that's just trying to figure out what is this all about, uh, I am a fan of no code right now. Uh, and we've seen it used by other people. You know, no code is quicker because you get to iterate. And as someone who loves to talk to, uh, to users, just like I asked my wife about her feeling on ChatGPT, it's much easier for me to say, hey, you know, based on this conversation, let me think about what I can edit, what I can improve, and then we can have a better conversation next week. And then you tell me how, how you feel about the updates that I've made to the app versus something that may scale over time, but is going to have a much difficult sort of um, uh, iteration process today. Uh, and that's one of the problems with custom. So I think that the, the decision has to be made you know, do am I testing something? Am I going for that MVP, that minimal viable product? Uh, am I still iterating and trying to understand the dynamics of the market? Or do I have paying users? Do I have a huge book of business that I can essentially just add in AI and essentially know that everything's going to run uh, the way it's running just better, faster? So those are the different conversations to be had about no code. Um, and so, let you know, we can start at the beginning, right? So deciding whether to build deciding what to build and deciding who to build for, you know, are the three big questions. So let's go through each of them. So deciding whether to build, right? Why are you building this? I mean, I think why is a big question regardless. For someone like me, it's a little bit of, I'm an innovator. I like to get my hands dirty. I want to understand the technologies that are popular. And so it's a little bit of that, but also I know as, you know, I think Dan and a lot of you here, AI is not going away. Um, if anything, you want to be on the team of, hey, let me understand this. Let me tackle this. Let me explore it versus, you know, let me sort of just sit on the sidelines. Um, having said that, what are the time money considerations, right? So for me, I'm sort of in transition. I built this blockchain company. Um, we're, we're getting some people in there to manage that, the technology, so I can be more hands-off. And the way I, I looked at it is I've got about 20 hours a week. You know, what can I do with that time? What can I build? Um, and what's your end game? So I, for, I, I think, again, for me, it's learning AI, experimenting, and generating a passive income stream and, and helping business owners, which is what I've always felt like I am, a small business owner. Um, now, when it, when it comes to deciding what's what to build, I think uh, we've touched on this earlier, but, you know, there's a lot of problems that are being solved. You know, I always look to myself. Uh, I don't try to, and I've learned this from taking on some venture capital money and building things um, that are sort of um, uh, driven by venture capital and discussions and advising discussions. What I actually found is that there's really got to be a sore spot in your own life and your business that you've come across. And we got to figure out how to solve that problem. Um, so it's early, right? And there's a lot of unknowns in the sense that I know going into this and something that we should all consider is we're building all of this on technology that, for example, like is ChatGPT can actually be turned off for a lot of us, right? Because we're basing our technology on an existing systems like OpenAI, uh, Baird, which, uh, which is a, a, a Google system, I believe, right? Because uh, I know Microsoft has their own. So we are essentially developing technology that's built on existing infrastructure. And as someone who's built in, in existing infrastructure, that other people have relied on, like there are things like downtime, right? Some like we've all been there at the beginning of ChatGPT where it didn't work, it didn't respond, you know, it doesn't give you. So uh, you got to understand that that's sort of part of the equation. The other part of the equation is how is it going to change every time? So if it changes over time, then if you're using that technology, you're feeding all of your users data through that information. If that model in the back end is being changed then the responses will change uh, whether you like it or not, right? So that's the question of all of the unknowns, where is it going? And then also this idea of, you know, how smart can this stuff really get? And then where do we come, come in as users um, or developers in the future? Um, I've heard, and maybe Dan has heard this too, that the job of the prompt engineer is not actually, some, so it's something that is popular right now, 
Uh, but Sam Altman, uh, the creator of OpenAI, actually said that he believes that prompt engineers are not going to be needed because the system will figure out uh, how to do that better and better over time. So it's kind of interesting. So then you go into just the last thing, shiny stuff versus the versus the the quick stuff, right? The low hanging fruit. So I'm more of a technical person. I actually jumped in on the PDF side of things. The first thing I did was I I, I wrote in Python in a very sort of dirty console system, nothing pretty. And I was like, hey, I want to be able to build my own way of uploading a PDF and then essentially being able to like ask the PDF a question. And I did that. I did it for Bitcoin. So I'm, fa I'm fascinated with Bitcoin and the Bitcoin white paper. So I used it as an example. And if you go to my LinkedIn, I actually have a video of me uh, asking questions and things like that in one of my highlighted things. Anyway, but I opted. So while that was my the first thing I built, I opted not to make that my product. The product was actually a simple uh, commercial generator or a pitch generator, if you will, for my wife. So she belongs to a networking group, BNI. I don't know if, who, if any of you is familiar. She's in the property and casualty insurance business. And again, not someone that's tech savvy, but every week she goes into a meeting and she wants to have a sweet, rememberable, awesome, you know, uh, uh, elevator pitch. And what I basically did was I was like, scrap this crazy PDF stuff, even though it's really cool. I'm just going to build this weekly thing that she presses one button and she's getting her, her pitch. And that's the low hanging fruit. So let's go into um, who to build for. So assuming this solves my problem, right? So I built this one quick kind of instant generator for my wife that gives her this 30 second elevator pitch. You know, now it's about, can this turn into a business? And what I started doing is I actually started to attend uh, networking events with her. I got invited to events and I said, hey, I've got this thing. You press one, you, you fill out some questions during onboarding and that's kind of how the system learns about who you are. You press one button and you've got a really nifty elevator pitch. Would you pay seven bucks a month for it? And surprisingly, um, every time I went to a BNI meeting, I had at least one person say yes. Uh, and that's how I validate. So I'm, I kind of come from the school of like the lean startup and I'm not, a, while I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to give away free stuff uh, for me to validate, I need to know that someone would pay for it. And frankly, what I pay for it. And that's also why my price point is where it is because, you know, seven bucks is, is not a hundred dollars, but it's also not free. Right. And it just a, sort of allows me to understand and validate that people not only value what I've done, but they're, they're willing to spend their own hard cash for it. Um, does anyone need this? That's sort of what I just went through. And then finally, the do the economics make sense? I think this is super interesting because while I have paying users, which we can go on to the next slide. Um, so uh, maybe that was next. It's fine. We can go back actually, so I can just finish this point. So while I have paying users um, and everything is really simple, you know, on the back end, I still am using open AI. I'm still using these large language models. And so every single time one of my users, let's say one of you wants to try this app out, presses a button, I get charged. And so the question is, you know, what is that? What do those economics look like? How many times can my users use the app versus what is my cost? And what's interesting is this is where you start to think, well, is this going to be a venture back business? Is this going to be a bootstrap business? Because what I'm quickly realizing is that um, for my business to grow, we're going to have to get into the volume game. So essentially, I'm not going to make money if one user gets on my app, but if he recommends a bunch of people, if, his, if, his ten, um, uh, if, if he's running a company and he's got 10 employees and they get on, those are the things that uh, are are going to kind of help me grow this business. And so let's, um, I guess we can move on from here. Okay. Uh, this is kind of my sweet spot. I'd help many people go from minimal viable product. It sounds like Amy is very good at that as well. You know, I'm a fan of the must haves, like what is the problem you're solving? That's why I literally started with one thing, which was my elevator generator. 
I built it fast. I think, you know, between, so I'm a no coder. I use something called bubble. I'll put the link in in case anybody's curious, because I think it's a sweet tool. Um, I actually am a trainer of bubble. I, you know, I do a couple of different, I was pretty early with that as well. And so I built this thing all in. It took me two weeks to build the whole thing, which included, you know, talking 20 hours a week. So about 40 hours of my time. Uh, and again, I didn't have to do it this way. I could have done some somewhat of what Amy did, but I wanted to put that pretty face on it and extract all the complexities. And that's really what I focused on. So I actually was not focusing as much on the AI side of things, which is really funny. I was focusing more on how would it look and appear uh, to my users. Um, and then my, my thing is I've told my team, I'm actually a perfectionist, which is really funny. So for me to say this, it's kind of like, I feel like, you know, <laughs> I feel like uh, my gut is, you know, puking or something, but it's 80% is go time. 80% um, is you got to let it go. You know, you got to let the market decide at some point whether what you have is worth it. And um, that's where I draw the line. And then I go back and I update the application uh, to make sure that um, I can improve. So, you know, we just started this. I was started playing around, like I said, first with the generation prompt. I, I'm adding every two weeks uh, at, at minimum, there's something new. Um, and that's been really fun. So these are some of the questions that I guess have come up and I've uh, have, have answers for these as well. Do you want to, do I, should I just go through them or do you want to go through one by one? How do yeah. You so, so I think, uh, you know, when folks are thinking about like a no code version of an app, uh, you know, hiring someone like your firm to build it for them, yeah. uh, you know, just getting a sense of, uh, you know, how much does it cost? How long does it take? Uh, what kind of support do you need to build it? Uh, and how do you go about finding that support? The, the bottom line is most of the people uh, who are here are, are not technicians and they don't have the knowledge to do this on their own. Fair enough. Yeah, sure. So I shared Bubble. I think Bubble is a great platform because whether you're building it or not, um, it's easy enough. When I say easy enough, you, there's still a learning curve. But it's one of those things that if you follow a YouTube, you know, you can figure it out. It's easier than WordPress. You know, it's sort of on the same sort of side as like a square space, if you will, if you're familiar. And so with that said, um, it's quick to get your product up. There's plugins, but at the same rate, if you ever wanted to take it off the hands of an engineer, if you wanted to get yourself in there, make some edits, whatever, you can do that and, and, um, it wouldn't be so complicated to do that. Um, like I said, it took me two weeks to build the entire thing. If I wanted to, I think, you know, Amy brought up a great point with so, some of these other tools that integrate today, you can build something in 48 hours. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why we're able to update every two weeks is because, you know, one week I'll have an idea or I'll talk to a user and then I'll spend the other week building. So it's sort of like I'm really spending just seven days at this point to iterate. Um, now, if I was to hire someone, I think, you know, I generally, when I first started, I went to Upwork. I remember Upwork being very helpful, but I would Google uh, for, or when I Google or go to upwork.com, I'm not sure how many people are familiar. Sorry, I mean, uh, Upwork. So I would look for uh, obviously people that have experience with the open AI API, What's really cool about APIs, um, so just to break this down, essentially what OpenAI, the company that built ChatGPT has done is they've said, hey, we want developers to build apps using our technology. And what they've done is they've created something uh, uh, called an external API. It's, it's a way for any modern engineer, if you, if you know any engineer that sort of has studied uh, how to build applications will know something about, especially if he's what they consider a backend engineer working with data infrastructure database. So OpenAI has really clear documentation. It has ways to access this technology. Um, it's penny, it's cheaper than you get access to things like the four model and all the latest models. And it's cheaper than $20 a month, depending on, you know, it's more, so the, the, the complexity is you got to set it up, right? As a developer, as an engineer. So that's where I say you can hire someone from Upwork. You can reach out to me. I can help 
uh, get you going. But that's sort of what I would be thinking about. Um, and then, you know, it sounds like Amy has some great tools as well, just because there are, I know, way simpler things you can do just with Google Sheets and, you know, all the new things that are happening with the integration of AI and just all the tools we're already using, uh, which I think is uh, is great. Um, so that's that's that. And uh, we'd be happy to, you know, answer any questions, help or et cetera. Yeah. You know, it's great to have a Gary on your side, on your side. Um, you know, uh, Amy, you have a technician on your team, right? Someone who is kind of more of the builder for a lot of these uh, solutions. You know, I'm really fortunate. I have a friend of mine who just thinks this is awesome and super fun and brain candy. So he just is like, oh, that's really cool. Let me just build it because he gets bored without it. So yeah, God bless the technicians for some of these pieces, but we oh do all God. the scope and the, the prompt engineering and all of that and the vision. And then he looks for ways that we can streamline it and automate behind the scenes. Great. Yeah. So for those of you who uh, have watched other master classes, my tech guy is Jeff Cooper from Saltbox. And whenever I have an idea, crazy or not, uh, I go to Jeff. Jeff is the kind of guy that spends his nights and weekends learning this stuff for fun. So if you're not already doing that, you're probably not that person. And that's OK. You just need to make friends with someone who is. It's a little bit like a boat in Miami. Uh, the old joke is the best kind of friend is a friend with a boat. When it comes with AI, the best kind of friend is an AI developer. <laughs>